room, there's a car passing. Has everybody got this? Okay. All right. Well, it's five minutes after. That means it's time to start. <laughs> uh, well, welcome to everybody. Welcome to our friends online. Uh, Diane, can you hear us this time? Mm -hmm. Who said he could hear us? All right, good. Your thumbs up. That's that's good. Okay, well, uh, yes, good morning. Uh, welcome to our study of Acts. Um, just as uh, before I jump in and offer us a prayer, this is a reminder, this is our uh, last one for this year. We take a little break and then we'll come back together on, I believe it's January 9th, is that right? <clears throat> this is the second Monday in January, and then we take off the next Monday for MLK. But I wanted to get us back in since I had had a couple of times when I was sick, and uh, we'll do the best we can to get through the whole of the Acts of the Apostles this year if we can. Um, all right, well, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, for this day, for this new day in which we get to live and move and, and fellowship, be with one another. A new day in which we get to encounter you and be encountered by you. We pray that you are with us now as we continue our journey through the book of Acts, learning from the earliest Christians what it meant to them to try to follow after you. We ask and pray you're with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good to see everybody. Um, there are handouts. There's a couple extras on a couple of the tables. So if you need one, um, please be sure to raise your hand and I'm sure we can get you one. Um, so let's jump in together. Um, so just kind of reminding us where we are. We are at the very end of chapter seven. Um, and we've just had a, a huge uh kind of moment a crescendo moment and actually we we sort of left off i guess the sort of what we might call the final day um last time which is Stephen actually being uh stoned so uh in terms of the flow of acts still in the first third or so of the book um and uh uh we we've, we've now uh surfaced or the the way that Luke tells the story has surfaced for us with significant resistance um, to the Christian community and certainly to the proclamation of Jesus, which again is not a surprise to us given the fact that that same pattern we found in the Gospel of Luke um, as we went through. Um, we had a figure who uh, in many ways I think kind of plays an outsized role because he only appears, you know, just briefly for a moment in chapters six and then in chapter seven, and then all of a sudden he's gone, and that's Stephen. Um, so uh, Stephen was one of the seven chosen uh, by the Jerusalem community uh, to address an inequity that was occurring in the distribution, probably distribution of food, but it, there may have been other things that were distributed. The word there is pretty broad. Uh, but care for widows in particular, as we've talked about, uh, simply care for the poor was very, very important in the life of the early Christian community, right? Use of possessions is a major theme 
as we've already discovered moving through the first part of the Book of Acts. And um, an, an inequity appears in the community between those who are probably Palestinian-based, which the text calls the Hebrews, and those who probably came from the diaspora, that is outside of Palestine, and the text calls them the Hellenists. So how does the church decide to respond to this? Well, basically they invent what we call, what we've come to call the diaconate, the idea of having deacons. And that word, of course, deacon means to serve, one who serves. Uh, Stephen is uh, one of those uh, figures among seven. And I think I've kind of pointed out to, to you the interesting thing about the, all of the deacons that are named and of the ones that we hear about in the telling of the book of Acts, none of them are pictured as quote unquote waiting on tables, which is the way that they're described uh, by the apostles. Rather, they are typically preaching, um, which is again, an interesting uh, uh, development and phenomenon. The most um, obvious of these and we will hear about one of the other deacons as we move into chapter eight uh, and a little bit beyond, and that's Philip. But the sort of the great exemplar of this is uh, is Stephen. So uh, Stephen is uh, was accused. Basically, I think it would be fair for us to say um, something like by his countrymen. Um, and what I mean by that is that more than likely Stephen and the other uh, deacons who, um, uh, ha who or the other figures who form the diaconate are probably all Hellenists, right? They're probably all from outside. And the text tells us that a synagogue of Hellenists winds up being the, the sort of the base or source of criticism um, of the early Christians, uh, at least in this new iteration of conflict. And they accused Stephen um, falsely of, of meddling with the traditions of Moses, number one, and number two, speaking against the temple. And it's similar kind of trumped up charges that we would be familiar with in the trial of Jesus and in the earlier trials of the apostles that we've heard about in the first part of Acts. Um, so uh, Stephen, uh, then is dragged before the Sanhedrin, and the text tells us um, that his face looked like the face of an angel, uh, and then he launches into a speech. Now, that, that nomenclature, the face of an angel, is probably a way of signifying that, um, that, that Stephen is marked off as a messenger of God, because right? that's literally what it means to be an angel. Um, and so what you're about to hear, then, is God's response to the accusations, to some extent, against Stephen. His whole speech, <clears throat> we talked about, is shaped um, according to a convention that you can actually find numerous examples of this in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets. And that is the, uh, the form of the lawsuit. Um, and oftentimes what happens is Yahweh gets really upset because of what the people of Israel are doing, and Yahweh brings a lawsuit against them. And that's basically kind of the structure, in a sense, of this speech. What's in the content of it? Uh, basically, there are four broad themes that Stephen winds up hitting. Um, he talks about Abraham, um, which is not um, untypical, uh, but Abraham is one who is obedient, right? One who is um, who listens to God's command, um, one who is, is circumcised, right, at, at an old age, etc. Um, and that's in contrast to what he says about the audience, which at the end he says are stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts. Uh, so. <laughs> So you got to see where he's going here. We then get Joseph, and Joseph showing up in a, a kind of telling of the history of Israel is a kind of strange or unique thing. You don't see that very often. But, uh, but Joseph allows Stephen to bring in the idea that Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. And one of the things that we've heard multiple times is that one of the reasons that the leadership in Jerusalem keeps going after these early Christians is because they're jealous of them and their power or their effectiveness among the people as to that theme of jealousy. The longest of the material focuses on Moses. 
Um, so the longest portion of the speech is about Moses. And I think the point there, number one, this is sort of Stephen's indirect way of um, responding to the charges that he's been the one who's tampering with the traditions of Moses. But number two, um, he is able to really show that Moses um, is was someone who directly called by God, and yet the people reject him. Um, and so he goes through like, the way that he narrates the story of Moses, highlights especially this, this sense of rejection. And as we get to about, I don't know, towards the end, or the, like the two-thirds through the Moses material, Stephen's speech becomes more and more pointed and sharper and sharper. And you can kind of feel the, um, I don't know if it's anger, but you can feel the pointedness and you kind of get a sense of where this might be going. Then by the end, we get a comment about the temple. Um, and I think it'd be fair to say, at least the way that I um, uh, framed it last week, is uh, it's not so much the issue of having a temple um, as it is the presumption that seems to come with having a temple. And what's that presumption? That God can be contained in a single place, that God can be controlled, right? That's kind of the idea that Stephen sort of hammers away at. So we don't know if that's kind of where the people were necessarily coming from because we don't hear them. We hear Stephen pushing back in that direction, and I think it gives us something of an idea of what he would see as the problem. So I mentioned here, right, all of the themes <clears throat> that he highlights touch upon, to some extent, the charges that are put forward against him. And at the end of this um, uh, uh, kind of lawsuit section, or the, really the whole speech, the question, which often happens actually in a lot of these early trial scenes that we have in the Gospels and in Acts, the question arises um, of who really has power? Is, is it the people that are sitting in judgment or those who are being judged? And then who's really on trial, right? And, and that also, this also, both of those things also um, uh, repeat or echo the way that Jesus' trials um, are often described, right? Is who's really on trial? Is Jesus on trial or are the people who are putting him on trial the ones who are uh, in the docket? All right, so that's kind of where we are. Uh, we have completed the whole of the speech, and uh, we're going to have some bloody action, basically, at the very beginning here. So can I get a volunteer who's going to read um, our opening passage? Okay. No, it, we don't. Unfortunately, we don't have one. <laughs> okay. Our technology is limited. Okay. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning people, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, and Saul approved their killing. Okay, so just one comment before I jump in with my outline, and that is, um, this is a place where you really see the master, the skill of Luke in telling a story, where he introduces here for us little drops this figure Saul. And of course, we're not going to hear about Saul. We're going to go away an entire chapter, and then all of a sudden we're going to come back to Saul. And so just the just the, the appreciation of kind of his literary skill, I think, is, is something worth noting here. All right. <clears throat> so we have had our speech. Um, if you have your Bible in front of you, you can certainly go back and see how the speech ends. Um, 
it ends with an accusation, which, which is typical of most lawsuit speeches. Um, there's an accusation, there's uh, the need for judgment, um, et cetera. But I, I think it would be fair to say that given um, the way that Stephen comports himself through this scene of him being stoned to death, is that he was speaking hyperbolically. And what I mean by that is he's speaking in the harshest terms possible, not in order to destroy his opponents, but rather to evoke, provoke them to repent. Right? So that's the ultimate goal. We talked a little bit about this last week, how uh, reading certain of these kinds of speeches, if we're not careful, can lead us down an avenue that looks an awful lot like eventually anti-Semitism, which has been the case in the history of Christian uh, theology and interpretation. All right, so having said that, though, what are some things that we can note? And I've kind of clustered, um, rather than going through each uh, individual, I've tried to cluster together what I think are two um, sections, really, in this little short brief paragraph. The first is the response. The, basically, the rage, right? I think it's, 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 I don't know how else to describe it, but it's, it's a scene of mob violence is what we have here at the end. Um, the, uh, uh, the nomenclature here, uh, starting in actually verse 54, when they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. That um, descriptor of grinding their teeth often shows up, especially in the Old Testament, for people who are um, uh, being described as enemies either of God's people or of Yahweh uh, himself. And, um, <clears throat> of course, this is a response uh, in the, uh, in the, actually, I should say, building on that, then verses 57 and 58, um, we go from enraged grinding of teeth, where if you just imagine the physiology of that, it might be hard to hear someone, right, to actually covering their ears as Stephen relays to them the vision that he's having, right? So in between uh, verse 54 and 57 and 58, Stephen has a vision, and I'll come back to the meaning of that vision in just a second. Um, but uh, in response to that, what do they do? They intensify their anger um, and their response, and, and we're heading towards violence, right? We're heading towards the end that we see coming. And I think the last thing to note here, sort of as a sub theme, which is probably one of the most obvious, but one of the saddest is whatever, and that is that whatever pretense to legality there was, that this was a trial being brought before a council, et cetera, et cetera, has been tossed out the window. What we have now is a lynching, effectively. Um, and Stephen is going to be stoned to death, and the response of him being stoned to death could be one thing, but it's going to be another, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, right? So that is the response of Stephen's adversaries to his speech and to whatever spirit it is that they feel coming through that speech. How does Stephen support himself and what is it that he does? And there really are three things to highlight here. And this, again, is the clustering together verses 55 through 56 and then 59 and 60. So first of all, uh, Phil, uh, uh, it, it is the contrast of Stephen um, over against his opponents. If his opponents are enraged and grinding their teeth, what is Stephen? He's filled with the Spirit. Right? He's empowered by the Spirit to respond. Um, and 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 what happens? What what is the content of that? I would suggest to you the content of him being filled with the Spirit is his seeing the vision, he's going to say, but then it's also him act, sort of acting on it by saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. In other words, the Spirit falls on Stephen and he becomes like Jesus because those two things also show up at the death scenes and trials of Jesus, right? They're not, it's not an accident in a sense that what's happening here is a, is a repetition, a kind of non, a non-identical non repetition of Jesus. So he's filled with the Spirit, 
And then he, um, he, he eventually says the very same words that Jesus says in response to his persecutors. So what do we do with those two things? The first is uh, Stephen's vision. And that starts in verse 56, um, or I guess it's uh, uh, 55. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, first of all, before I go any further, this is obviously important because it's given to us twice. It's repeated. Not only does it tell us what Stephen sees, Stephen then tells us what he sees. So this is an important point, right, that, that, we, that, that, the, that Luke's trying to get across to us. He sees this. Well, what is it that he's seeing? He's seeing what is tantamount to the scene in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, um, I talked about this kind of ad nauseum and at length when we did Luke. I'll just remind you, especially uh, our folks who weren't with us through Luke. In Daniel chapter 7, there's a key moment where Yahweh is gathering um, all of the, the heavenly entourage um, and the book of life and judgment is about to be opened up and the nations um, are about to be judged, in particular the beastly nations. And um, as a component of that scene, a consort comes out to sit with Yahweh, which is kind of unheard of, someone else who would sit on Yahweh's throne. And that, who is that person described as? Son of man. So this scene, this kind of echoing here, is an echo back to Daniel 7. Well, what is that scene? It's a scene of judgment. What are we in the midst of right now? We're in a trial scene, a scene of judgment. And so what is this meant to tell us? It's meant to sort of say to us again, who's really in charge? Who's really on trial? Is, is Stephen the one who's really on trial, or are the people who are perpetrating the crime against Stephen the ones who are on trial? That's often certainly the way it plays out in the synoptics. The unique thing, however, and this is very unique, is that typically in, when Jesus recounts that scene, when he says, from now on you will see the Son of Man, such as that, he always says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, and what you have here is the Son of Man standing. Now, none of the commentators know what to make of it, or I should say, I shouldn't say they don't know what to make of it. I'm just to just say that they all have different theories. But most of the theories, and I think the most helpful ones, are um, that Jesus standing is almost a, a kind of gesture that Jesus knows what's going on. He's standing up on Stephen's behalf. He's, in a sense, like he's actively acting on his on the act of his behalf. He sees what is happening, um, uh, and and so there, it takes there's something there that takes on kind of palpable and profound meaning. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There were seem to be two two uh, that you could go with. One, no one can stand before God. And therefore. Sure. Yeah, you could have a, a kind of the, a theological, right, an argument there for a, a crystallological. And then, and then the, the, on the throne is the place of authority and power. True. And it, it also conveys completed work. Mm -hmm. And so there's also that sense of him standing and therefore um, this picks up on something that we hear in Paul, which is filling up the sufferings of Jesus until they're full. Like so, that the, the life of the church and the drama that happens with the church adds somehow to the story. Yeah, we hear it. Oh, wait, wait, didn't you have a hand up? I did. I was signaling to you. Okay. All right. Okay. I did not. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. You were like, um, let me explain. Okay, well, no one can see me online. That's good. All right. Uh, and so then, and I, and I, I, I confess that. Um, and so yeah, the the Jesus is standing. I, I like particularly the idea of 
the sense of attentiveness to Stephen. Whether or not that's really what Luke is after, it could be a couple, two or three other things. And so you have options here in terms of how you would understand it. I do think, though, that the seeing of the scene in general, and because we're in the middle of a quote unquote trial scene, that makes sense. Right? And that's really what's going on here. Stephen is, being, is, is having conveyed to him that what appears to be, who appears to be under judgment is in fact not. It's really the opposite. We then have what I think, frankly, is one of the most touching things. And uh, so, yes, I might, I might get a little teary. I don't know. We'll see. Um, uh, and that is uh, Stephen's prayer. Um, and I, I, one of the reasons why I find this so touching is because when I talked through Luke, um, I was really struck at the very end of Jesus' life how consistently Jesus was Jesus, right? To the very end, he extended forgiveness. Um, and in particular, in the trial scene, you know, the powerful people keep talking to him and kind of, you know, poking him and trying to get him to respond for their purposes. And he never talks to them. But when the thief on the cross begs him to have mercy on him, he talks to him. And then deep, deep down inside, you know, he says these these words. These are part of that last uh, seven words or whatever of Jesus, um, where he, he pronounces forgiveness over his enemies. And so here is Stephen, in a sense, being the most Jesus-like that you could possibly imagine. So these words of forgiveness, I think, are even more important than the vision, frankly. Um, because they show us, in a sense, um, at least from Luke's perspective and the perspective of the early Christians, that this is what it meant to follow, right? It meant to be truly faithful unto death, faithful to Jesus' way, all the way, right, to whatever that your cross might look like. It may or may not look like this. But Stephen's witness, right, essentially is sealed in his own blood. And this is the way that the early church spoke about um, violent martyrdom. It was a stealing of your testament or testimony in blood. Um, and remember, to be a martyr, that word martyr is simply the Greek word for witness. You're stealing your witness, right, is the idea. Giving your life for this. So praying for his persecutors is a very different vision um, of, than what we often hear about martyrdom today. All right, then we get uh, these little, as I've already kind of mentioned, the little details, um, but uh, again, the kind of masterful storytelling skill that Luke has um, as he introduces us to probably one of the most important characters, certainly in the book of Acts, and I would suggest for you know early Christianity, our earliest documents come from the hand of this man who starts out named Saul, was breathing murderous threats and doing everything, in fact, he can to see it go through. Eventually, will come to be known by us as Paul. So he is introduced to us in a context of violence and murder, mayhem, and his conversion, in a sense, is uh, it, it occurs among a series of conversions that we would probably have to say are simply incomprehensible. That the Samaritans would be converted and, and you know, they would be included to receive the spirit. That the Ethiopian eunuch would receive the spirit. That Cornelius, a Gentile, would receive the spirit. That one of the great arch enemies of the church who sought to like kill us would receive the spirit. That's that's sort of the setup that's coming as we move through the next several chapters. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, it is to me like I, I kind of this my last little comment here was just sort of what if we didn't hear anything else about Saul? You know, um, what lesson would we take away from this? Here would be a, a young man caught up in the machinery of power, and um, and and who knows what kind of career he might have had. Um, had he not been hounded and captured by Jesus. So, 
All right, let me stop for a second and see if there are comments or thoughts or questions or if there's, yeah. I have a question with the forgiveness there. You said he is, he is witness to steal in his blood. His own blood. Yeah. Yep. I I just when we keep going through this, I I keep getting struck by the fact these people really take religion seriously. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that. I mean you say the wrong thing. I mean they move from cat calls in my Rioting mob of cat calls and whistles and invective. Well, that's one thing. Right. But then they drag you out and stone you. I mean, well, there's a lot of speech really isn't no. at work here. <laughs> and that's like a that's like a funny laugh, just so you know. <laughs> it hurts because my ribs hurt, but it's still it's still like a yeah, I, I, I do think, so number one, this is a different world. A real different world. Yeah. But the other thing, one of the differences about it is that religion and religious identity is bound up with everything else. So this is both a religious disagreement, but it's also a political disagreement. It's also an economic disagreement. It's also a foreign policy. Like all that stuff that we in the modern world have typically tried to pull apart back then was bound together. And so Stephen is effectively a traitor to his people. And and so, you know, and so as you think about uh, how would I make sense of that, I think that's at least helpful, but it's true. I mean, it's all put in religious garb. And I think one of the things that we see, and I think this is helpful also, Jeff, is um, that part of the story of Jesus is precisely to critique some of that, the use and misuse of religion um, in people's lives, right? And so, so it's very, you know, there's a lot of different directions that that, um, that your, your insight there could go. January 6th all over again. Yeah, yeah, there's we're definitely gonna, some. You know, we're going to go in and we're going to take this, we're going to take you down. And if you're Mike Pence, we're going to kill you. Right, we're going to put you on the gallows. That's right. Was it illegal for them to do what they did? Take him out and show him? Yeah, so this is a great question and one that's sort of debated in the scholarly literature. So number one, um, the way that the Romans typically interact with their client states. And so the Romans, the Romans, their sense of empire is a little different than we might think, because we typically think along the lines of a nation state, where whatever's in the boundaries, there's you know, there's probably one primary power in control with maybe some subsidiaries. In the in the Roman world, they really had sort of patron-client kinds of relationships. So the, the way that they interacted with their client states is that they would often give them a certain amount of freedom. To execute certain kinds of judgments, um, so there's a debate about is was this legal? Um, it on the one hand, it does seem to fall under the legality of Torah, which is that you could stone a blasphemer. Um, but the response to Stephen's death is not typical of what happens if someone was stoned to death. No one was allowed to mourn for them. Well, what do we hear in uh, in verse two? Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation. So they both buried him, which you weren't supposed to do, and they lamented his death, which you weren't supposed to do. And I think the implication of that, what that tells us, at least according to some scholars, is that people view this as far far more of an illegal act than than a legal act. So, but that's it's kind of it's not settled or that's sort of the, some of the historical background possibilities. Other uh, other questions? These are great. Online. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Cliff. Hey, Cliff. No, we... Go ahead. Now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, trial is all taking place by Jews. All right? And uh, I know there's always a question about whether Luke was also Jewish or not. 
And I wonder, in context of what you're talking about, if uh, this uh, is evidence that maybe he was not Jewish because the search certainly doesn't put the Jews in a good light. I mean, this, this is really what you were saying before, is that uh, the Romans uh, let the Jews take care of themselves. I mean, the Pharisees and the Sanderines are all Jewish. And uh, I just wonder what uh, a reflection of Luke's point of view do you think is here? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would I would say that I, I don't I think generally the consensus is that Luke was not Jewish; he was Gentile as an author. But I think that the distinction here is not between is not sort of about you know Jew versus non-Jew. It's about the elite versus the common, or the elite versus the poor. Um, the apostles are constantly portrayed as country bumpkins. Right? There are people from Galilee, that means they're not highly educated, etc. And Stephen is like a deacon, right? And he's an outsider. Um, and so I think really the kind of argument here is not so much an anti-Jewish argument as it is a kind of criticism of power in religion. Um, it, it, that would be sort of the direction I would probably want to push that. But that's a good question. And your question is, I think, gives a kind of sense about how it is that if we're not careful the way that we read these texts, we can find ourselves walking down an anti-Jewish track. Whereas I don't think that's really what's at, at stake here. It's more of that kind of internal fight. All right, let's that's move forward. I'm, I'm particularly interested about the, uh, the origins of anti-Semitism. Uh, at this stage of Christianity. Yeah. Well, I think we have, there are texts um, that are clearly deeply problematic. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to certainly sit down with you. I mean, I tend to put it about a, a century later where you really get things off the ground. Um, but there are, there are at least enough passages that can be pushed in a direction, like particularly the Gospel of John has some, there's some spots in Luke that we, you know, you want, you have to be, I think, or you want to be careful, you know, unpacking it, but it's, it's pretty early on. Um, uh, and, and, and whether that's anti-Semitism or anti-Jewishness or Judaism, that's another one that we'd have to talk through, but yeah, I appreciate those questions, Puff. I have another question. Yeah. In my um, my Bible here says <laughs> godly men. It was godly men that buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Right. So it wasn't the people that found him. No, no, not at all. No, but but the idea is that no one is supposed to bury him and no one is supposed to mourn for him. Okay. If you were stoned, it was that like if it was a legit. That was at least the the, the Jewish tradition, um, but yeah, there is some wiggle room there, of course. Yeah. To follow Jesus, um, someone who was crucified, could they have mourners in the tomb and the oils and the? I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, he also is hung on a tree. And there's a Deuteronomic passage that talks about cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good. That would be a good question, though. That's some similarities. Right, all the way through. That's right. And also that he wasn't supposed. To, whoever's hung on a tree is supposed to be left up there overnight. Right. But whether or not there's a tradition about burial and and the sort of typical thing that we would consider like burial rites, whatever. I just I don't know in terms of that particular. But I, I do know from the stoning in part because the, the commentators were kind of constantly bringing that up. Um, all right, let's move ourselves then on to the next uh, passage. I get a volunteer who's willing to read. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside in Judea and Samaria, 
Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. Paul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went from place to place for crick over death, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. The unclean spirits, crying with loud shrieks, came out many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed and lame were cured. There was great joy in that. Okay, so now we get our second um, story with uh, having to do with uh, the deacons. Um, so let's start out here. Uh, so obviously uh, the first thing, uh, in a sense, like I guess these first uh, three verses um, function somewhat as a summary statement, but it really has to do with the fallout, right, of what has just happened with Stephen. Um, right, so Stephen's death itself is not going to be um, the final end. There's going to be further fallout uh, that occurs. And then we kind of get a shift starting in verse 4 as we watch the fallout, um, which, which is, of course, going to be decidedly negative, all of a sudden turn into some uh, the pathway to something profoundly positive uh, and, and, and sort of new. Um, so verse 1 then tells us, uh, right, that the severe persecution uh, begins in the city of Jerusalem. Um, now we are pivoting. Um, remember that from chapter 3 all the way up to about now, pretty much everything that we heard about has been either in Jerusalem or around Jerusalem. And now all of a sudden the story is going to start to be pushed out into new realms. Um, we're going to hear first about the story of, in Samaria. Then we're going to hear a story that's going to take us south of Jerusalem, down into Gaza. And then we're going to start to hear about stories that are going on further north of Jerusalem. And then before we know it, we're going to be in Syrian Antioch. Um, and so the sort of the geographical spread sort of starts. And, and that fits with Acts chapter 1, verse 8, right, which is, you'll be my witnesses in, Jumeri uh, in, Ju in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, right? So that whole thing uh, is at play here. So suddenly, right, uh, we, we have a kind of relative security. I wouldn't want to describe it as security, given the fact that the 63rd uh, trial scene that we've had in these first eight verses, but a sort of relative sense of, of stability, of uh, calm of growth um, that's been going on in the community. This is now scattered or upended. upended. And um, what it tells us is that basically many in the community, most in the community are diasporized, right? They're scattered. Um, they become uh, in some ways like Israel became um, after uh, uh, the Babylonian invasion. The term uh, diaspora uh, is the term typically used there, and um, its first use, uh, certainly in its Greek form, was oh, as a way to describe what happened to Israel when it was sent out into exile. And exile is a sentence of death in a certain sense. Uh, I think it's worth, uh, certainly in the context of Israel's history. But what we find is that death is not the end, right? The most famous vision that happens in the exile is, can these bones live, right? Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones in the valley, can they be brought back together? Can this body be re-knit together? And Ezekiel says, only you know, Lord. And then what happens? It does happen. So diaspora is a kind of, um, I don't know, liminal state not all bad, it's not all good, but it is an instrument. And that's what we're gonna see here, it's going to become an instrument by which the gospel is gonna be spread. And I also would like to say that I think in general, this actually fits with patterns of the gospel spreading that we know about historically. 
So, for instance, um, uh, I've taught you a class before called Christianity on the Silk Road. More than likely, um, there was some spread of the gospel that was happening on the trade routes that headed into Central Asia and over to China by some merchants. But it was really when the Persians invaded Rome and took uh, captives uh, from um, one of the key cities in Eastern Syria, um, a large portion of them were Christian and forced them to resettle in Persia. That became the real root of the Persian church. So it's a horrible thing that they were taken prisoner, right, and captive, et cetera. But somehow then the church spreads, right, the gospel spreads. And that is just similar kind of pattern here uh, that, that's sort of going on. And I, I highlight here, say, someone like Joseph, right? And Joseph is kind of the poor example of this. His brothers are jealous of him. They sell him off to get rid of him. What does he wind up being? The salvation for his brothers and his father, right? Because he goes down to Egypt and something amazing happens, et cetera. So scattering is bad, but it's not necessarily all bad. In fact, it can be too a way of uh, um, something becoming good out of that, which is bad. The text also tells us, and this is a, a peculiar thing. That, again, there's no uh, set interpretation, but it says to us that all except the apostles were scattered. Um, and so there's been sort of, there, it's not clear what exactly does this refer to. I, I thought that uh, the argument that the apostles remaining in Jerusalem um, as an indication of their resolution to face persecution was probably a legit good answer. Uh, but again, it's uh, other than that, I'm not sure that I have a, a way of making sense of that, um, that statement. Then verses two and three, um, right? So devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women He committed them the prison, right? Uh, I've already mentioned this, uh, right? Stevens, uh, the fact that he's buried and that loud lamentation is made, that means public lamentation is made over him, indicates that whoever buried him did not think that his execution was lawful, um, right? They, they did not play along with Jewish tradition. Um, and, and we get that sort of compounded now by Saul's activity. He's going from house to house attempting to drag out um, uh, these early Christians um, and, and to basically rid um, the earth of them. Then we get, though, a shift. So we have this negative going on, very strong negative going on, and all, but, but that's not all that's going on, right? And that's where we turn, uh, starting in verse 4 up to 8. And let me just kind of read through this very quickly. Now, those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame and cured. So there was great joy in that city. So the first thing I want to note is that the very first sentence grammatically indicates that the people who were scattered couldn't help themselves. They just started, they just proclaimed the gospel. Like literally the way that the grammar is set up, um, they were going to be witnessing to Jesus wherever they went. Right. So those who, who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Um, where the, where does the episode kind of give us an anchor? Right? We get kind of a, gen a vague generality that wherever they're scattered, they're preaching the gospel, and then we get brought into like an actual scene. Well, it's in Samaria, right? Um, and, and this then constitutes, this moment constitutes the first major step beyond the Jewish boundary, right? And, and we, we can think about how... Um, Already, we've had indications that, that things were going to head in this direction um, all the way back in Acts chapter 2. We've already heard um, of uh, an in a sense that uh, this was not going to be a movement 
that was just going to be rooted in Palestinian soil. It wasn't going to be a Hebrew language only movement, right? It was going to have other languages that were going to be involved. There's Hebrews and Hellenists, et cetera. So there's already this sense of diversity, we could say. And now that is, again, expanding, right? And in a way that was probably troubling for some. And again, as I've mentioned to you, this is a consistent pattern in the book of Acts, which is God wants to trouble the church. Um, so buckle up. Um, the, the Samaritans, again, right? Uh, just to remind you, basically the Samaritans are um, the people who were left behind during exile. So more than likely, these are folks who would have been poor um, and uh, probably welcomed the powerful being taken off because remember the powerful being taken off part of the reason why was because they exploited the, the poor. But th they also intermarried and that became a huge issue uh, once the exiles returned. Um, they also relocate their center of worship away from Jerusalem um, to uh, the city of Samaria or Shechem or Sabbath. These are kind of the options that are usually put forward. So they're cousins, effectively, we could say, of the Jews. They're, it's, a ha it's a step beyond the Jewish boundary, but it's not a huge step. But, but you, know, the, you know, oftentimes the people that people hate the most are the people that they're related to. All right? So the, the intensity here of, of despising and, and anger would be real. We want to keep that in mind. Um, and interestingly, I, I kind of thought about this uh, as I was reading through it. Um, the text tells us that these people listened and saw. They did the two things that the Jerusalem leaders they just couldn't seem to do. They couldn't seem to uh, the, remember most of the trial scenes that we have early in Acts. They're, they don't even care about the fact that people are being healed or the truth of it or not. Um, they don't even want to hear about the preaching in the name of Jesus, right? They just want them to shut up and stop causing trouble. Um, well, what do we have here? We have the exact opposite response, right, um, of a careful hearing, a careful seeing, um, and, and, and the response of joy, right, effectively, which is um, a, kind of a mark sort of vaguely, I suppose, um, of the spirit being present in the midst of this. All right, let me stop just for a second before we jump into, because we're going to be now introduced to a very interesting character um, in, in early Christianity, a man named Simon Magus. Are there any comments or questions before I transition? I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Jesus when he says, uh, let me tell you about the good Samaritan. Good and and the crowd kind of laughing. Right, right. Like nothing good comes from Samaria. What are you talking about? So they're like, yeah, that's gonna be a great joke, <laughs> right? Then I'm dumb. <laughs> Other comments? Other questions? Thoughts? Okay. Then let's put us into our next. We're still in uh, the sort of the Samaritan mission. Um, and this will go on for several verses. Uh, let me get a volunteer as one to read our next uh, passage. Is there? Now, a certain man named Simon has previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from least to the greatest, listened to him immediately. This man is power of God that is called great. And they listened easily to him because of a long for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip which I'm sorry I might have been like it, they believed Philip who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of but they were baptized both men and women. Ever, even Simon himself believed 
after <coughs> being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and the miracles of the church. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to, I'll unpack a little bit here and there, uh, but I just want to name um, our figure here. And you can kind of see that I'm sure you can find some other artistic renditions. Uh, but Simon is here in the corner um, trying to buy the power of the Spirit from Peter. Um, and we're going to hear about that in just a moment, uh, because for now, at least Simon is sort of a somewhat sympathetic figure. This is a figure who uh, is, is, uh, comes to be named, known as Simon Magus, Simon the Magician. Um, he takes on a life that goes way beyond this passage, these, the passages we're about to hear. He's kind of, you know, I would say in these passages, he's sort of an unfortunate figure um, who's clearly misled, but, but there's no sort of definitive sense that, you know, that, he's, that he can't be reformed and, and kind of brought back in. He goes on, though, in the history of Christianity to becoming the first heretic. Um, so when we get up into the third and fourth century, and Christians are kind of fighting back and forth about well, what is true, what is true Christianity, what's truly acceptable and what's not. One of the best things to get your enemy or your opponent into trouble is to say you were a student of Simon Magus, even though Simon had lived, you know, 200 years prior to that. So he takes on, I would suggest, a, a very outsized role from what we hear about him actually in uh, in the text. However. The one thing that I do think is important, uh, and I think we can take away, especially of the description of Simon, uh, is um, that he functions in a way that is remarkably similar to the way that it sounds like the apostles and the early Christians function. What I mean by that is he performs signs and wonders, and he proclaims things. Those, both of those things are at play in his ministry, right? Um, so he proclaims what himself, right? The text tells us um, this man is the power of God that is called great. And, of course, we hear about his magic, um, uh, other, other kinds of signs and wonders that he performs that captured the imagination and the uh, attention of the Samaritans. What... Do we take from this? I think what you take from this is um, you have to beware that the form is not necessarily the same as the content, right? The form here of signs and wonders and a proclamatory message, which Simon has, really sounds an awful lot like the form of the preaching and work and ministry of the apostles. What's the difference? The difference is that the apostles are speaking about Jesus. Right, and the way of Jesus and living out that life, whereas Simon is talking about himself. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's the content, it's the material content, in a sense, that, that marks off the difference as opposed to simply the form. Yeah. Maybe you just answered this. I'm not sure. A magician does magic things <clears throat> that appear to happen but don't really. Well, and Jesus and his followers performed miracles to be seen for reasons of. Did Simon, was he really performing miracles at the time they found him? If so, did he get this power because of his belief in Jesus, like the apostles, disciples did? But, so let me kind of cut through okay. of that. And say, first of all, just I don't think you're saying this, but I want to make sure everybody's clear. Magician in the ancient world is not the same as magician today. That's number one. Um, uh, magician today takes on the air of entertaining, performative, you know, right? Magician in the ancient world, I mean, there were people who wanted to argue that Jesus was a magician because of what he was doing, the healing signs and wonders. Um, if you remember... When Moses confronts Pharaoh and, um, and he throws his staff on the ground and it becomes a snake, 
who is it that also can throw their staff on the ground and become a snake? The Egyptian magicians. So they carry a certain kind of quasi-religious healing um, a connotation with them in, in a way that sort of almost makes them sound like they, they would be holy men or they would be people who would um, advise great you know, powers or whatever the case may be. So Simon, I don't know what he actually did, but he's decidedly not pulling rabbits out of hats. It's kind of what I'm trying to say. He is certainly probably doing something that um, that makes people have to sit up and think that um, some kind of power is embodied in this person, right? For them to take on the myth that more than likely he himself either encouraged or maybe proclaimed, that would be the... So I, I, I'm hoping that that um, helps to cut through. Um, and, and that's when, this comes back actually to your comment from last week, John, of discernment, right? Discerning. Um, and this is why Simon May just probably takes on a, a role as a sort of pipe in the history of Christianity because he sure looks an awful lot like what a Christian apostle would look like, right? He's able to perform certain miracles and signs, and he has a pro proclamatory message um, that maybe, you know, blends in, but it's at the end of the day, the content of it does not match the actual content that, that the Christian gospel wants to mess. I got like seven hands, which is great. Yeah, I knew I was going to open up this one. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, what, you know, in verse 13, it says, uh, after being baptized, Simon stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and miracles that took place. Doesn't that suggest, doesn't that suggest that there was a clear qualitative difference between what Philip was doing yes. and maybe the trickery that Simon was yes. playing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally. And but 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 the form. It's that form versus he, he content. He looked good. He was good at what he was doing. It's, that's right. That's exactly right. And 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 Phila, or uh, and and Simon is like he he is amazed. And he, but we as we're going to find out, he's also going to have amazed for still the wrong reasons. Like his own his transformation is not complete, um, as we'll find out in just a moment. I think it, I, I would, I, I would, I, I, yeah, I think verses, you know, verse 13, Simon himself believed. So there's a part of me that kind of feels sorry for Simon that he becomes the arch heretic in the history of like, you know, theological debates because, which, which happens from time to time. There's a lot of people that get a bad rap. Um, but this is one of the great all time kind of bad raps, potentially. All right, there were other hands. Yes, Chief. Well, I was wondering if the power that he had would be the power from Satan. Well, that's, it's, we don't know. It could, it could, maybe not. You know, that's, but it certainly, as when it goes on into the history of Christianity, I mean, look at, look at the way that he's portrayed here. Right? If you look over there, you can see even better. He's dressed all wet in black. Um, his skin tone, and this, of course, is the racialized element, because uh, this is a European piece of art, is darkened. He's put in a he's put in a darkened corner of this, right? So he is clearly associated with the dark arts, that we might say, um, in the his kind of in the history of Christianity, whether that's justified or not, you know. And I think we I hope we've kind of come back to that a couple times. Yeah. No, I'm just going to say, in, in our usage, magic is illusion. I mean, we don't believe magicians really, you know, that there is any supernatural things involved. You know, it's pen and teller. Right. Know, we're, most of us are in on the joke. Our, in our even day. Even if we're not in on the joke, yeah. we know it's a joke. Right. We know it's pretend. Right. And I think in that, in this, in this time, there was a different kind of connotation carried around the title magician, that you really did have access to something. Um, what that something was depends right on the questions and comments. There was another hand over here. Lane, did you have a hand? I was just wondering, did he currently believe he was baptized? Because that's the nature of what he was saying. 
Well, we'll find out in just a second. Um, that's a great question. Uh, there's going to be a little interchange between he and Peter. And uh, yeah. All right. So just a couple more comments then. Number one is, um, is does pick up on some of the points that you guys have actually already made. Uh, John, your point was great in the sense that here is um, a figure who is astonished at what he sees Philip doing, um, which of course is not counterfeit, is, is real. And so we, we hear then in verse 12, um, a, a kind of like putting an end to Simon, a, a, almost abrupt. His power is kind of drained um, immediately because of the, the proclamation and work um, uh, of, of Jesus in and through Simon. And I think what we take from that or what maybe Luke wants us to hear, because this is not the la going to be the last of the confrontations between the gods. We use that language. Right? As, the, as the apostles, as other Christians venture out, there's going to be confrontation with the gods. Right? And that's going to be a, a political and everything else, but it's also certainly going to be religious. And... One of the things that we, we get sort of again and again is that this confrontation is between two powers that are not equally matched, right? Because Jesus is the real deal. Um, and that's what we see here as a sort of first take on that. We then, uh, I think, as I mentioned here, verse 13, and I'm, you know, you guys may be persuading me a little bit more today than when I wrote this the other day. I don't know. But I have here, like, we don't really know the sincerity or lack thereof in Simon's conversion. Not clear, but like hearing you say, you know, what you're saying, even verse thing, even Simon himself believes, right? I mean, there is more of a sincerity there uh, than I was kind of initially thinking of. Um, he is, however, right, we got to keep reading. <laughs> exactly. Um, he is, however, clearly attracted to power. And I think that's one of the things that we should also take from him hanging around Philip. He won't leave Philip's side. Not because he feels, you know, loved and welcomed and you know, wrapped up by Philip, but because he is interested in power. And I think that's something that we've already seen. He had, he had the power to mesmerize the Samaritan community, and now he's lost that. Um, this question, one of the things then that Simon does I think raise is is the way that spiritual power can oftentimes be confused with other kinds of power. Right? One of the things we're going to find out in just a minute is that Simon thinks that spiritual power works the same way other kinds of power works. The person who exercises it, it's under their control. Um, it can be procured through normal means, i.e., I can bribe it away from you or pay for it some other way or another. Um, he, he doesn't have a sense of um, of the upside downness, right, of Jesus's power. Um, the fact that it doesn't work that way, uh, but we'll see that here in just a second. I'm going to move us into give it our time so we can finish up this theme. We won't unfortunately get into the Ethiopian. Areas, but can I get a volunteer who's willing to read? Yeah. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Mary had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying out of the temple's hands, he offered them money, saying... Give me also this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may, re may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, Simon, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to you. Now, after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news 
to many villages of the Okay, so there's a lot going on <laughs> in this passage. Um, and I, there's, I, I do want to make a couple of um, observations that I think um, connect to what we've been talking about, but I also want to highlight a couple of other things that we might miss on the periphery. One is um, the idea that um, Philip has been proclaiming the gospel to the Samaritans, and there's almost like starting in verse 14, the folks in Jerusalem didn't know about this. What do you think you're doing, sort of? And, th and there's a certain kind of sense in which like, Philip is out in front of the church, like what he's doing. Um, and so the, the mother church, right, which is kind of the way I think it would be fair to think about the Jerusalem church, at least at this point in the story, they need to send in you know, their operatives to see what's really happening, right? So they're going to send down uh, Peter and John. So uh, it, it does, this, this indicates some things that are not entirely clear. Is this an argument for, is this sort of highlight for us that there were already like struggles about the direction that the church should take, who was really in charge, all that kind of, those are all, this is one of those places that's fertile ground for that kind of speculation. Um, I think a couple of things that we can say but number one is the idea that the Jerusalem church would send the apostles to Samaria is um, in and of itself pretty remarkable. Given the level of animosity between Jews and Samaritans, um, they clearly took seriously that something had been happening in Samaria, and they send in, you know, not just the B team, they send in the A team, right? Uh, so John and Peter go down. Um, the second then thing then is as a component of that is that this is a, an act of connection. That the Jerusalem church is not just sending them down to sort of, you know, get tabs on them, but as the text tells us, um, uh, the two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And so their intention is not to get them in line, it's rather to extend the fullness of the blessing. Right? So, so the connection element here, I think, is really important um, uh, because the, these new hearers of the word um, uh, need to be unfolded. The second thing that is also a, a kind of track that we'll hit from time to time in the book of Acts is the connection between baptism and the spirit. And uh, uh, as if you know anything about the history of the church, you know that this is an area where churches have split and divided. Um, should baptism be, you know, given to children or only adults? Um, is when you get baptized, are you being regenerated? Or is baptism more of a kind of symbol that means you're included in the community, right? We have our own theology of baptism, actually, that we function with here in the church. I think one thing we can take from this, um, however we think about the connections and some of those questions, is that at least for Luke, there is an assumption that both baptism and the reception of the Spirit is um, what marks off a disciple, right? And I'll just kind of throw this out and say that I think baptism functions as something like an identifying marker. Um, uh, to be baptized is to uh, proclaim your loyalty right, um, is to uh, uh, receive a mark, essentially, whereas the Spirit is what empowers, right, the Christian life. So baptism is an identity marker. Giving of the Spirit is the empowerment element. Um, does it need to look like Acts chapter 2, where you're all speaking in tongues? If it does, then you probably need to be in a Pentecostal church. Because, uh, you know, but, but the point kind of still stands there, right? So these are both in events of reception. I think this is important. In other words, the, the Christian is actively passive. What I mean by that is that it, the Christian is active in the sense that they are believing, they trust, they come forward. But the primary actor in this event of baptism in the spirit is God. Right? God is the primary actor. So that's what I mean when I say actively passive. Um, one of them clearly empowers spirit, while the other one clearly, um, I think, identifies. All right. 
So we get this, um, and we get this little brief commentary. We also get, for just a second, a pause where we might say, oh, um, the apostles have the power to decide who gets the cure or not. Uh, you, could, you could come away reading this text thinking that. But thankfully, <laughs> that's going to be, the rug of that's going to be pulled out from under when um, Peter goes and visits Cornelius because he's going to start speaking and the spirit's going to fall on Cornelius without any function or role. So the, the power of the spirit of the, we're going to find is not under control of the church, um, but the church can be a conduit for that. Um, that at least is the hope. All right, so then what do we get? We, then we get uh, some more drama from our good friend Simon, uh, starting in verse 18, right? So now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, right? So he's watching and he's thinking, oh, they have the power to do these things. He offered them money, saying, give me also this power so that anyone on whom I may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. All right. Obviously, Simon has misjudged, <laughs> because as we hear from Peter, uh, he really uh, strongly uh, pushes back and, and effectively rebukes him. So what are the levels? And I, I mentioned here, there's several sort of levels of misunderstanding. Um, and I kind of have three uh, that I, I found uh, compelling, at least in the commentators I was looking at. The first one, I, which I think is probably the most important one, is the kind of idea that, that Simon is, is operating with um, or thinking that the power of the spirit operates like other types of power, other types of social power. Right? It's something that you can possess and something that you can deploy as you see fit. And that is decidedly not how the spirit works. And we're gonna find that out as we move through that the spirit blows where the spirit blows, right? That's kind of one of the main mantras. The second, of course, is uh, an assumption that's built on the first, and maybe this even said there, and that is that the apostles can control the spirit, and they cannot, as we will find. And they certainly cannot control the spirit for their own material gain, which I think is where buying and selling, right, the offering of money comes in. And that again, uh, leads them to the third, right? That the apostles in the community, this is a, a last uh, mistake, that they operate the way that other groups operate, right? Which is they buy and sell their goods. Again, this episode with Simon, um, I think is also a good salutary episode in the sense that you can find numerous examples in the history of the church where the church, in fact, does act like this. It does buy and sell itself. It does, you know, allow its religious identity, its words, its power, whatever you want to say, to function the way that other powers do. Um, and, of course, that then becomes, uh, I think, a place for the peak for the church. Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you said, but doesn't it seem to the people who were seeing what was happening here, particularly of Philip, that... He's doing all the planting here and, and doing the spade work and everything and baptizes them. But then the A-team comes down from Jerusalem, lays their hands on them, and then they get the spirit. It's, it's like Philip is a second-class citizen here or something. Yeah. I mean, it would tend to suggest that people would get the impression that the apostles... There are some people that have that. Yeah, have yeah. this control. And that's where, as I said before, that's where it's like this, this is fertile ground for these kind of conversations about the dynamics within the early Christian community um, and whether they're like, how was leadership structured? How did power actually work in the early church? Like who was in charge and who wasn't? Um, was it shared leadership with the 12 apostles? How does that work when many of them are off being apostles somewhere else, et cetera? But yeah, what you're kind of picking up on there is like it, it's it's there in the text a little bit, kind of unspoken. And and I'm not sure exactly how to resolve it, other than we keep reading 
And what we find is that the apostles um, oftentimes, and particularly the Jerusalem apostles, are in fact not always on the cutting edge of things. Uh, and, and, and the second half, of course, of the whole book of Acts deals with someone who is not a Jerusalem apostle, right? Someone who's sent from Antioch. So there, there's ways of around that, but I do think that, like, you could leave this scene thinking precisely that, right? That the Jerusalem church had to kind of somehow weigh in um, to protect its power or its its prestige. Yeah, Tom? Um, this more so that this is more like the um, story back in, in Joshua, you know, because they were having victories and victories, and you get to uh, Um, but, um, you know, somebody had stolen uh, some articles from the town that they should have, uh, that were under sanction. They destroyed. Yeah. And so uh, this is actually revealing something drawn. That, uh, and, and maybe Simon's the crux of why this thing would fall on anyone. Anyway. Uh, that's interesting. That's an, that could be a very interesting reading, yeah. The silent becomes sort of a personification of a deeper problem for the whole community. Interesting. All right. I like that. We got to talk some more later. Um, all right. So then what happens? Peter responds, right? Uh, responds to this request uh, and the, the set of assumptions. Uh, and, and the response is, I, I think, relatively straightforward, uh, right? Um, uh, and that, and that is that Simon is one who is obsessed with power and more than likely power for greed, right? Power to, uh, to, to accumulate, um, whether that's followers or, or anything else. And so the fact that he wants to exchange money. Um, in this case, I think it's fair to say that um, we have now a, another recapitulation of Judas and maybe even Ananias and Sapphira. But in the case of Simon, there's a door for forgiveness that's left open. Right? We don't hear the same kind of shut door that we got with um, with Judas. Um, and, you know, maybe Judas could, certainly could have received forgiveness, and, and who knows if maybe he did. Um, but with Ananias and Sapphira, they get a shut door. And of course, they, their judgment doesn't necessarily mean that they're condemned to hell or anything. But there is that distinction here, right? Because there's no sort of sense of finality in the way that the story is told about Simon and his response. Lastly, is uh, Simon's own response. And I think this is interesting as a kind of final um, exposing of Simon. Simon begins our entire section um, about Samaria, uh, Samaria as a very powerful figure, able to uh, perform signs and wonders with his own unique message <clears throat> as a conduit for God's power, etc. And he ends um, begging for someone else to pray for him because he can't pray for himself. Right? I mean, I think that's the kind of way of thinking about this in terms of a full full circle. Um, lastly, then we get verse 25, which functions for us as something of a summary statement. Right now, after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. And so, again, a summary statement that tells us about the rapid spread. Um, of the gospel. The very next story, the one that we're not going to do today, is um, is of a figure who comes from the, what, what would have been the edge of the known world. And so this is the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And so we'll take up that story in January together. Um, and uh, let me end with, uh, I've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, I decided today go with um let's see here Christian? yeah before we do the question Mike and I have to go we have a repairman coming to our <laughs> disposal 
need that for Christmas. <laughs> All of us have so enjoyed oh. this and been praying for you and your health. Thank you very much. And this is for everybody. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to be able to, I, I love teaching and I love being able to teach through scripture and uh, seeing your smiling faces and having you come back is really, true, truly has given me joy because we went through a couple of years where there were just a few of us in the room and there were others of us online. And so um, I'm so happy to, Didn't to we be. give you joy in those days? <laughs> It was like Adjuna, Adjuna, Joy, <laughs> but seriously, thank you so much. So I, I, what I've given to you here is kind of uh, broad uh, questions I thought were ending. Um, we've gone now through about the first third of the book of Acts. Um, I think there's about 24 chapters. We're kind of in the middle of chapter eight towards the end. Um, what has stood out to you so far in our study? Are there any particular themes that you've noticed that you found especially challenging? And uh, what do you feel like you've learned? And you can, you know, as you're able, you know, you can answer uh, one of those or you can answer the question you thought I should have asked you. Uh, that's always an option. Uh, so I'll give you about four or five minutes. And again, if you need to go, you're certainly allowed to do that as, as needed. Uh, but I'll come back and we'll have a conversation. Yeah. 
But it's in the But
That's recorded in the revelation that we have. Right. Right. Yeah. And it says the gospel's not working. In that they were bad back then. We got the same problem today. <laughs> Well, I mean, they're, they're just like we are today. Well, that's they're true. Just like they were back then. No, I, I, I would, well, but what, but does that require until we say the gospel's not working? That would be my. I, I do think, though, I do hope that as we've gone through, you do have a feeling that, like, in a pretty profound way, we are just like them and they are just like us. Yeah, the humanity comes through, right? Exactly. All sinners. But but the gospel power, right? That, and I think this is where I've been stressing this idea that it's often the spirit that's operating outside of what the church would expect. You know, like, I mean, for the, the fact that the gospel would go to the Samaritans, probably, you know, if you took a poll, if you did a survey, <laughs> you know, 70, 80 percent would be like, uh, no way. And then when it goes to the Gentiles, it's probably been higher. I mean, uh, so I, 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 yeah, I do think and, and hope that you've gotten that sense of, yeah, the limitations. Um, and I hope that, to me, that's a sort of source of hope. It can also be a source of frustration at the same time, though, so I, I get that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just struck by this. We don't spend a lot of time in Acts. We, we we deal mostly with the Gospels and the letters, but we don't spend time in Acts, yet it's critical to understanding the development of Christianity. But we sort of, I don't know why we bypass it, or maybe it's too hard to capture in a few Yeah, days. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do, um, it is interesting that like certain traditions um are shaped by certain portions of scripture so um we come out of the reformed theological tradition the swiss reformed tradition which is probably shaped above all by the book of romans and the gospel of john right so that those were the two uh texts that calvin and others were just you know they hammered away at it um whereas i grew up methodist just like you, John, right? Jeff, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and and Wesley loved Matthew. Like he loved the Gospel of Matthew because he loved the Sermon on the Mount. And if we were Pentecostals, we would have spent an awful lot of time probably pouring over the Book of Acts. And so there might be some of that as a reason why uh, we don't hit it, but I, I'm happy that we're doing it together now. And I certainly hope that you're kind of leaving with a sense of, you know, the acts of the spirit as much as the acts of the apostles. Yeah. It, it really, uh, when you read through this, you're like, you, you, you can take away from it, man, the Lord is patient. <laughs> you know, at its very root, at its very root are, you know, normal human beings just being human sometimes. Yeah, Tom? Um, so I was just thinking about what else was talking about when you were saying, um, you know, he, he, as Billy Graham was saying, God has no grandchildren. You know, and, and we are all just one generation away from totally disappearing. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, I think that's important for us to be reminded of that. In our in our concern, in our legitimate concern about the decline of the church, et cetera, there is a certain sense in which the church always faces death. It's, it's just part of the reality. You know? So I, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Hey, Cliff, did you want to make a comment? I think I saw something on there. No? 
What is you're it? muted. <clears throat> or no, you, you're good. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had some general comment about my personal response. It's just for you. The message is for you. Oh, okay. All right. I appreciate that. I can see that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so are the Lutherans uh, tied to Romans? Yeah, I think I think like uh, Luther loved the Book of Galatians and the Book of Romans and also the Gospel of John. Like he was; those were kind of the the ones. Um, and and like I said, the Methodists, you know, the there was the, that, that Matthew and I don't know if I have enough for every. What about us Presbyterians? <laughs> that's uh, well, that that's what I was talking about with the um, the Gospel of John and the Book of Romans, as was so important to Calvin. Um, and, and kind of central to what he is about. So, um, let me, uh, as a as a wrap up, uh, are there things that we can put down on a a, a prayer chain here? I, I've written down Terry Warner because you know his brother just passed away. Are there other concerns? Um, yeah. Well, Jane Bowler's having uh, back surgery. She has a growth on her spine that's starting to get. Together's health, <clears throat> mental health, and and just also we want to obviously keep in mind that um, Christmas can also be difficult uh, for different types of reasons as well. So, um, yeah. I will mention the coming birth of my very first great grandchild. She is expected. In South Carolina, they're living. They expected that Christmas Day. Well, oh, not, my. Not, 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 last word was they're going to induce some Tuesday. All right. Her mama is my granddaughter, who some of you will remember years ago when she was in junior high and beginning high school with terrible cancer in her shoulder. She was in the hospital in Rush, Rush Hospital in Chicago for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we almost lost her two or three times. Mm -hmm. uh, they did an extreme surgical procedure. She had chemotherapy, which is still functioning and or not functioning. It is still doing damage to her kidneys. So <clears throat> the mama has had lots of problems, and the doctor said, if you want a family, and you get pregnant as soon as you want to, as soon as you can. Because the longer you go, the more difficult it will be for you to have a full pregnancy and a healthy baby. So they were married just a little over a year, and they're happy that this new baby is coming. My daughter and her husband are in South Carolina, and we're just praying and praying that so this tiny little girl will make her Appearance and that everybody will be healthy. My first great grandchild. That's awesome. Can you, can you share a name? Linda, can you share a name with us? Uh, my granddaughter is Katie Jo. Hey. Okay. I can't even say her last name. Oh, right What's the now. baby's name? Um, can't remember what they're going to name her. I'm sorry. What are you going to name her? Linda's great friend. That's right. That's right. Well, let me say. Um, <clears throat> let me say. If, unless there's something else, um, um, I'll say a quick prayer. 
And uh, I, I won't necessarily, I don't know if I'll mention all of these, but we'll have them all in our hearts. And uh, I just want to say also Merry Christmas, all of you, and Happy New Year. Uh, we'll meet again, as I said, on January 9th. And uh, obviously, I hope that I'll see you around uh, for different services and other kinds of opportunities. And uh, I hope that you have a really restful and wonderful Christmas holiday. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for um, the time that you give to us to study, to fellowship, um, to be challenged by your word and your spirit. We pray that you are in the midst of the life of our community. We pray that you are in the midst of all the needs and the challenges that each of us are confronted by, um, keeping us uh, healthy as families gather, keeping us um, in spirits of peace as well as families gather. We think of our friends, um, Jane and, and her back surgery and pray that she's able to do that um, sooner rather than later, that you're with the doctors, give them uh, precision and good judgment as they go in to help relieve the pain that she has. We give thanks for Linda's great-grandchild, the birth of her first great-grandchild, and um, her, her grandchild, Katie Jo, and pray for her health. And we think of our brother Terry as he continues um, his journey of grief at uh, the loss of his brother. Lord, we thank you so much again for this time, and, and we pray that you're with us now as we go forth into the day. We ask you to pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Merry Christmas. Right. Thanks, Cliff.